Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10 essential 19th century symphony cycles for non-beginners. This is the next level, or maybe the level after that even, for people who've already sunk their teeth into the basic 19th century symphony clumps. So if you like Beethoven and Schumann and Mendelssohn and Dvorak and Tchaikovsky and all of those people, and Brahms, of course, I mean, how could I leave all Brahms? And Bruckner, my goodness. Well, you're going to want to hear these folks. Maybe. <laughs> I can't guarantee it, but I can suggest it. So let's get started, shall we? Because you're all non-beginners and you know where we're going. First, Crummer. Franz Krummer, Frantischek Krummer, if you use a Czech composer. And some of these Czech German composers, you know, they operated under German names during their lifetimes. But nowadays we're we're rechecifying them, so their names may be different. I mean, you know, that makes it even more entertaining. But you non-beginners don't have any problems with that, I know. Krummer is marvelous. Krummer actually lived about the same time. He was born around the same time as Mozart, a little earlier. And he died around the same time as Beethoven and Schubert. So he's he's a classical composer, but he didn't start writing symphonies until the late 1790s. Uh, and then most of them occurred after 1800. So he's the first in our quasi almost chronological list here. And Cromer wrote nine symphonies of which number eight is missing. So I have listed here eight symphonies. They're numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. And people who love Schubert will be used to things like that. You know, the numbering and the number don't quite correspond. Cromer was a wonderful composer. He's best known today for his, his writing for wind ensembles, his wind partitas, which are absolutely delicious. They're glorious. But he actually was a violinist, and he wrote like a bazillion string quartets, which nobody knows, and would be wonderful for somebody to dig up and start performing. I mean, the ones I've heard sound pretty damn good. And his symphonies are likewise. They begin in a quasi-Mozart-Haydn vein and end up in a quasi crummer vein. I mean, they're really cool. He's a wonderful orchestrator. And because of those wind things, you know he writes wonderful music for wind ensembles. He really does. I mean, the wind section of the orchestra is absolutely fabulously used. They're very colorful pieces. They also sound recognizably Czech, like early proto Dvorak, which is really cool. Now, I've reviewed all of these things on classicstoday.com, some of them with sound clips for insiders. So if you want to go read those reviews, you probably should. They're all available on CPO, one of the labels we have to thank for this, this whole enterprise being possible. CPO, Naxos, a couple independent labels. They've got cycles of all of this music. They've done the clumps. They are clump mavens. So we're in business. Begin with Crummer, and you will love these, these non-beginning symphonies. Next, Eggert. Hmm? Who you say? Who's Eggert? Nicholas Eggert. I think his name was Nicholas. Eggert lived in Sweden. He was a Swedish guy. He was like the, the lead of the Swedish Opera Orchestra back in the day. He wrote four symphonies, and they're on Naxos, and you really need to hear them. They are really cool. And again, I've reviewed them on classicstoday.com. Go have a look. These are these are major discoveries. They're they're all written in about the first decade of the 19th century. They're, they're contemporary with Beethoven. They don't sound anything like him. They don't sound anything like anybody else. He uses percussion. He uses a full theatrical orchestra, and he writes like fugues, bass drums, solos, and things. I mean, it's weird, unbelievable stuff. Really, really cool. Um, and if, like I said, I mean, if you haven't heard him, you you really want to. You're really going to want to. Give Eggert a shot. Um, like I said, they're on Naxos, and he's a, another major discovery. Epic. Incredible. Well, I mean, there are only four symphonies, and, you know, God knows what else he did. There's some incidental music and other stuff coupled with them. But he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a find. You will be so happy that you that you paid attention to Eggert. I mean, believe it or not, you're going to be running around telling all your friends about Eggert. You're going to you're going to become an Eggert cult member. You're going to be an, an, an Eggert, Eggert, Eggertomaniac. 
guaranteed. After Eggert, let's do Ferdinand Ries, why don't we? This was Beethoven's buddy, his best friend, or one of the few people he got along with. Ries wrote eight symphonies and a whole pile of piano concertos. Beethoven had complained when listening to Ries' symphonies, he keeps trying to sound like me, Beethoven said. And Beethoven was right. He does try to sound like Beethoven, only he's not nearly as good as Beethoven, but that doesn't mean he was bad. It really doesn't. People who are, you know, gifted at at imitation sometimes can do good things themselves as long as we don't uh, expect any noteworthy originality coming from them. And Reese is one of those. He really is. But these are lovely, colorful works. And they're, again, you can get them all on CPO and a couple other labels have some of them. And they're definitely worth hearing to see what was going on in the first decade of the 19th century in the, in the, the post Haydn and Mozart era. You know, because the thing about, you know, Beethoven is that Beethoven is sort of just sucked up the entire, you know, first couple decades of the 19th century as a symphonic composer. But there was a style. There was a classical style of symphonic composition that ran parallel to what Beethoven was doing. And it sounds not as original, of course, as Beethoven, but it's within that style and very nicely done within that style. So, I mean, Crummer is one of them, and Rees is one of them, and Eggert is sort of like out there all by himself, but it's really nifty. It's worth hearing. And next, one of the other major discoveries from the first half of the 19th century, Kalavoda, Johann Wenzel Kalavoda, sometimes now that he's been rechecified as well, he is Jan Kalavoda. His symphonies are fabulous. There are seven of them, and they're on a bunch of labels. They're on Orfeo and, and CPO and some other places, um, some on MD&G. Uh, they are really cool. Like all the Czech composers, he seems to have a real gift at wind scoring, but he also could write really terrific tunes. And I've, I've been enjoying these symphonies just enormously. His fifth symphony is one of the really major ones. It has a a slow movement that is so delicious. It sounds like a little bit of like a Tchaikovsky ballet. Da 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 ba da 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 ba da 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 Great stuff. His third symphony was written when his baby daughter came up to the piano and whacked out like a group of, of atonal phrases, and he used those as the thematic material for the symphony. He had a sense of humor. He wrote three marvelous string quartets and, and even better, 24 concert overtures, which not all of which have been recorded. That's a project somebody should undertake because some of them are absolutely fabulous. There's one of them on the CPO disc that has symphonies, I think, five and seven. Um, it sounds so much like Sibelius. It's so cool. I mean, really, really fascinating. Fascinating guy. So after Kalavoda, well, we have to do Spohr. Ahem. Yeah. This is the problematic one. Now, Spohr wrote 10 symphonies. Spohr was not a good composer of symphonies anyway. I mean, he wrote tons of chamber music. He was so-so at some of that. There's some beautiful works. He wrote lots and lots of music, and some of it is beautiful. His clarinet concerti are lovely and sort of, you know, the major works in the form after the Mozart clarinet concerto. And it, the problem with Spohr is that he had no sense of form and no sense of timing. Oops, <laughs> it kind of matters. It, it, it's not even that. It's that everything he did lacks muscle. He discovered the joys of Mozartian chromatic harmony carried to romantic lengths. And as a result of that, uh, his music just never goes where you think it's supposed to go. He was incredibly popular in his lifetime and for quite a time thereafter, especially in England. And, uh, you know, his... Symphonies, some of them are programmatic, some of them are terribly clever. There's one for two orchestras that oppose each other. It's, you know, it's about like, you know, the state of being or the creation of the universe. I don't know. There's one called The Consecration of Tone, number four. And, and you know, it, it, it 
wonderful ideas pop up, but he never seems quite to know what to do with them. And as a consequence of that, he sort of, you know, evaporated after his death. And, and rightly so, but because we're into discovering things that, you know, maybe didn't deserve to evaporate so much, you should give Spohr a try and see what you think. Chances are what will happen is that we'll, ha you, we'll, we'll, is that we'll happen with, what will happen with you is what happened with me, which is you'll listen to it, you'll think, oh, this is really cool. This is very pretty. This is really nice. And then <laughs> you'll just forget about it entirely. You, know, you won't ever want to go back because because the, 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 the repeatability isn't there, the, you know, the Sturm und Drang isn't there. He hated Beethoven symphonies, but conducted them regularly because he felt that they were important. He wrote a wonderful essay, which I've read on this channel, about how horrible Beethoven's fifth is. And so he wrote a fifth symphony in C minor that supposedly demonstrates how a real fifth symphony is supposed to sound. Yeah, right. Well, we all know how well that went, do we? Don't we? His funniest, well, funniest, he had no sense of humor whatsoever, but his funniest symphony is the historical symphony, which is number six, where he writes a movement in, in historical styles. And he starts with Bach and Handel. That doesn't sound anything like Bach or Handel. Then he does Mozart, <clears throat> which doesn't sound anything like Mozart. And then he does a scherzo in the style of Beethoven, which doesn't sound anything like Beethoven. Then he has the current period, which of course he hears as one of unrivaled decadence and and decay, and he writes it in the in the style of Italian opera music, and it has percussion banging away, and it's you know all kinds of tacky harmony, and it just goes to show that he had no sense of humor at all because he doesn't even know how to do that in a fun way. He's trying so hard to show us how horrible this music is, and people who write music that's based entirely on negativity tend not to do very well. But it's a fascinating essay in Spohr's inability to be anybody but himself, number one, and number two, and, and that himself is, is only modestly entertaining. But it was an effort, and he gave it a shot. And then his own style kind of fizzled out as we get to the later symphonies, and even he admitted that in his autobiography. You know, really kind of a, a strange man, but supposedly a very good man. I mean, he invented the chin rest for the violin. He was very kind to all of his colleagues. He was he was a major anti-monarchist. He worked for the monarchy, you know, his whole life. But he insisted on the rights of artists, on the dignity of artists, on the importance of their work, on treating it properly. I mean, you know, he was selfless and altruistic and dull. So that's Spohr. After Spohr, let's perk up a little bit. Theodore, Theodore Gouvy. Now, Gouvy was a French composer. He was a French classicist who really was a, a symphonist to the manner born. He wrote seven symphonies. Six of them are numbered. There's also a Sinfonietta, and there's a piece called Sinfonia Breve. You might want to say eight symphonies, but the Sinfonia Breve, the short symphony, is as long as the regular symphonies. There's nothing Breve about it. And they are really solid, good, attractive French works. I mean, the style is conservative, but the music is really well put together and, and enjoyable to listen to. He also wrote some operas. CPO has his stuff, most of his stuff. And it's, it's really interesting to hear a French composer who was completely attracted to the Germanic style, to the classical German school and was perfectly comfortable operating in that sphere. And his symphonies are another major discovery, I think. They're, they're, they're really worth hearing. They're very, very good works. You won't, like, you won't like all of them equally well, but if you like the symphonies of like Gounod or the Bizet Symphony or these sort of conservative French symphonies, the early Saint-Saëns symphonies, you're gonna really enjoy Gouvy because the craftsmanship is there because he's French. Yeah, craftsmanship is always there if you're French. And and this, I really enjoyed getting to know them. I really, really did. And again, you can read reviews on classicstoday.com to get a sense of the music. I, I, you know, I'm not going to keep repeating that, but go there and look up these composers because I've heard them all and I've reviewed them for you so that you can get a sense of what you might like. And you could also often hear them with sound clips, especially if you're a Classics Today Insider member. And that will give you some 
foretaste of what to expect. Now we turn back to the second half of the 19th century, well, Goofy was second half of the 19th century, um, and, and to Felix Dreisecke. Dreisecke represents the dilemma of the post-Beethovenian German composer in a particularly acute form because he's best known for his monstrous oratorio trilogy, Christus, which is one of the dullest pieces that ever, you know, exuded from the brain of, of humankind. Um, it's, oh, it's, well, it's Christus. It's, it's you know, the life of Christ in three two-hour-long oratorios or something like that. You know, it's a post-Wagnerian oratorio extravaganza that will have you slashing your wrist. Um, boy, is it dull. But his symphonies are something else. And this is what's interesting. His most famous symphony, and this is the dilemma of the German composer, was the third, which is subtitled the Tragica. Even Brahms liked it, liked it. And it has one cymbal crash in it or something like that, which, believe it or not. Um, there's nothing terribly tragic about it. it it's, I mean, you know, I mean, Brahms' fourth is vastly more tragic than Dreisica's Tragica. In fact, his Tragica might have influenced Brahms' fourth. Who knows? Uh, it really, but it's a good, solid, Sturmendrangy, German, turbulent kind of piece. Somewhat, somewhat turbulent. The tragedy of Dreisica's output is that he was best at funny music. He could be really, really funny. His fourth symphony is subtitled The Comica, The Comic, and no one pays any attention to it whatsoever because it's comic and he's a German symphonist and it's not heavy and serious and sententious and pompous, and, you know, but it is comic. It's really funny. The second symphony, the second movement, or the scherzo, I think it's the second movement, is marked The War of the Flies. And you've got a cymbal player who's doing the fly swatter that's buzzing around. And then, you know, he's going like, swack like this, trying to get the flies. And it's, it's, it's really cute and clever and adorable. It's cuddly and snuggly. All the things German music is never supposed to be. His second symphony has a delicious scherzo and a very funny finale. He could do it. He really could do it in a romantic vein. It, it, it's charming. It's marvelous. Unfortunately um, for him, he was a heavy-duty German composer. Um, you know, it's kind of, sort of like people don't value him the same reason the, the English don't value Arthur Sullivan the way he should be valued, because he wrote fabulous comedic music. And we just don't value humor. Maybe because classical people have no sense of humor. That's a possibility. Or they don't understand humor. Whatever it is, they devalue humor, which is a tragedy. And it's a tragedy for Dreisica that we only value the tragica. <laughs> That's the tragedy of the tragica, as opposed to the comica. So give Felix Dreisica symphonies a try. I mean, the first is sort of conventional and not too interesting. But the next three are, are quite something and, and different from everyone else. Back to France now with Louise Farenc. Oh, has she become a flavor of the month? My goodness, because, you know, women composers are all the rage and we're trying to dig them up from previous centuries where they were roundly neglected, um, somewhat neglected anyway, and some of them were actually played fairly often or were at least respected. There's Emily Meyer in Germany, whose music we're still getting to know, but Louise Farenc's three symphonies have now been recorded several times on several labels, and they are, as you might expect, um, traditional, conservative, 19th century, post-Beethovenian symphonies um, of excellent workmanship, kind of like Gouvy, really sort of in that vein. I, you know, she's not a marvel of originality, but no female composer in those days who ever wanted to be for, performed could be. You know, you, you had to do what what had a chance of getting played. And what had a chance of getting played is what would have been accepted by men, men who were largely academic and largely conservative in their tastes. And as a result, I mean, unfortunately, there were not like a lot of women composers who were writing for a jury, the single member of whom was barely a who's. <laughs> I mean, that would have been different. Then we would have had a wild original raft of, of female composers in the second half of the 19th century. But Farenc, again, is another one of those perfectly talented second tier composers who wrote some lovely symphonies. Now, the next one is, is kind of major. He really is, and he deserves, I think, I think of all these 
you know, non, non-beginner people, some of them to also, well, a lot of these people deserve to be performed. Now, Cromer deserves to be performed. Egert, Kalavoda, you know, Goovy, Dreisig. Okay, so they all deserve it. What the hell? Raff, Joachim Raff, who was Liszt's assistant um, in orchestrating some of his music. Raff wrote 11 symphonies. Uh, most of them are programmatic. The last four are a Four Seasons clump of symphonies. And before then, there are some really good ones. I mean, one is On das Vaterland, to the fatherland of Germany. He's actually Swiss, but you know, who's counting? And, and the most famous one is number five, Leonora, which is really a good piece. It's the, these are programmatic works, most of them, not all of them, but most of them. And uh, Leonora is, you know, one that typical story about, you know, the girl's dead boyfriend comes back from battle as a ghost to pick her up and they go on this wild ride, supposedly he's, he's whisking her off to hell or something and depends what happens. You know, Dvorak did the same story in The Spectre's Bride. So, uh, you know, it's a famous folk ballad. And, and uh, this is really a lovely, lovely work. It's repetitious. Raff's sense of form was very, very stiff. He really regarded the sort of just discovered rules of sonata form as inviolable laws. And so a lot of his music, you know, has these, you know, repeats and formal sections that aren't terribly necessary. And you may not want to like hear it all, all over again, but he was another very gifted orchestrator. He wrote too much probably, um, and didn't quite know when to stop, but it's awfully enjoyable. And they've all been recorded very well on uh, the Tudor label, Swiss label, um, beautifully done. And you can get them in a box. I've talked about them on this channel. And the fifth has been recorded several times. Bernard Herman made a recording of it actually. Um, so did Nimi Yarvi who started to do a cycle of Raff symphonies on Chandos. I don't know what happened to it. It never went very far, but these pieces are definitely worth rediscovering and you'll enjoy them. And he was a vibrato guy. Best of all, he writes vibrato in his scores in various places where he wants extra on the violins. At what spots where he wants you to really hear the vibrato, telling us not that it was only used as an ornament in that one note, but that rather it, there was a range of it, a range of intensities of vibrato usage in his day, because he was a very, very skilled orchestrator. So he's a guy worth discovering. And last but not least, of course, the great non-beginner symphony cycle for the, in my view, the second half of the 19th century, the most underrated clump of all is Glazunov's. Now Glazunov wrote eight symphonies. Uh, he may be, maybe he was most comfortable as a ballet composer, but these are lovely works. He was so talented. He was just incredibly talented. He was another composer who didn't have a lot of muscle. He wasn't into, you know, raging despair and huge, huge depths of emotion and the romantic vein, the stuff we kind of look for. He wasn't a Tchaikovsky hysteric, but he was a craftsman and a composer of tremendous elegance who had a serious melodic gift. And those symphonies, we've talked about them before, but I have to put them on this list because they are absolutely beautiful and they deserve to be performed and heard and reconsidered for the, the, the delicious and delightful and and, and masterly works that they are. And you can find them where you can find them. The best Glazunov cycle is Nimi Yarvi's on Orfeo. There's also a very good one by um, Jose Cerebrier on Warner um, that's more recent that contains all kinds of other Glazunov stuff. It, it, he's just a composer worth discovering. Just reams and reams of colorful, tuneful, enjoyable music. And if it doesn't plumb the depths and and search the Empyrean heights of sublimity. Well, I can certainly live with that. I mean, you know, sublimity is a sometime thing anyway. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. And I hope all you non-beginners start non-beginning. Take care.